Ecuador has had a tumultuous independent history, best exemplified by its 20 constitutions, a record surpassed in South America only by Venezuela. The country has suffered through countless coups and wars. This weakness has led to Ecuador losing territory to every single one of its neighbors. To understand the reasons for Ecuador's fragility, join me for this brief explainer on the history of Ecuador's history and politics. During the colonial period, the Real Audiencia de Quito, which comprised much of present-day Ecuador, was something of a backwater. It was not a source of gold or silver for the crown. Instead, its resource base lay in agriculture. The highland indigenous population became subject to forced labor on the landed estates and textile mills owned by the colonial elite. Thus, class and ethnicity were conjoined early in Ecuador's history, leaving a long legacy of racism. After Napoleon's toppling of the Spanish king in 1808, appended Spanish authority in the colonies, Quito was the first place in the Americas where locals attempted to claim autonomy while the monarchy was restored. So on August 10, 1809, the Criollo elite signed a document declaring as much, a day that is still celebrated in Ecuador today as the first cry of independence. The Spanish colonial government's response was swift, however, and the new regime barely lasted 24 days. Still, this was only the beginning. What followed for the next decade, mostly among criollos, that is, Spanish born in the Americas, was a civil war between those who wanted to maintain loyalty to the Spanish crown and those who wanted independence. In the end, what tipped the scales were Simon Bolivar's troops. The final blow for the Spanish came at the Battle of Pichincha on May 24, 1822. Led by one of his lieutenants, Antonio José de Sucre, the victory for the Ecuadorian rebels destroyed the remaining royalist forces and secured the independence for the Real Audiencia de Quito. Given how and by whom it had been liberated, the territory naturally decided to join with Gran Colombia, a largely Bolivarian project that also included Colombia and Venezuela. The union was not a happy one, however. Warfare would dominate politics. First, as the front lines in Bolivar's liberation of Peru, and later in the armed struggle between Peru and Gran Colombia over the location of their common border. Thus, once Bolivar's star began to fade as people found him increasingly authoritarian, the divisions between those who wanted a federal system and those who wanted a central one became too large to overcome. On May 13, 1830, Ecuador declared its secession from the Union just nine days after Bolívar's resignation as president of Gran Colombia. Ecuador kept little from that union beyond the flag colors, not even its name. The newly independent state opted to name itself República del Ecuador, or Republic of the Equator, a name inspired on a text published in 1748, Noticias Secretas de América, which gave account of a scientific expedition that came to South America with the purpose of measuring the roundness of the earth. The New Republic's first 15 years were dominated by Juan José Flores, a Venezuelan and former office in Bolívar's army. He faced multiple armed efforts to try to annex Ecuador back to Colombia, but he was able to beat them back. When he changed the constitution in 1843 to try to keep himself in power, however, he faced a massive liberal rebellion what Ecuadorians call the Revolución Marxista, or March Revolution, and was promptly deposed. The Marxista period, which lasted from 1843 to 1859, was a series of weak regimes dominated by an elite minority, a propertied upper class uninterested in promoting a broad-based democratization. This elite was divided by geography and had contending economic interests. In the highlands, large landowners lorded over traditional haciendas, exploiting Indian laborers who were subject to exploitative arrangements reminiscent of serfdom. Allied with the Roman Catholic Church, these landed oligarchs formed a conservative party to defend their interests. On the coast, maritime commerce and tropical export agriculture produced a different, more entrepreneurial upper class, the coastal elite interested in free trade and secularization became the bedrock of the Liberal Party. These political divisions 
rooted in geography, would continue to shape the country's politics all the way to the present, and would be especially violent in the 19th century. Between 1861 and 1912, this conflict was embodied by two men in particular. Bitter opponents who would end up sharing a similar fate. The first one, Gabriel Garcia Moreno, dominated politics between 1861 and 1875. He was a staunch conservative, an authoritarian and fanatical Catholic who tried to limit citizenship to Catholics only, but who also tried to fight corruption and promoted science and higher education. In the end, this dictatorial manner ended costing him, however. On August 6, 1875, he was stabbed and hacked with a machete in the steps of the National Palace in Quito by liberal opponents. The second one was Eloy Alfaro, a radical anti-clerical man born in Manabí, one of the coastal provinces. Alfaro was the leader of what Ecuadorians call the Liberal Revolution of 1895. He served as president for 11 years and brought important modernizing reforms to the country, including curtailing the power of the Catholic Church, establishing separation of church and state, and building the Transandian Railroad to connect the coast and the highlands. He also established the first public high schools and universities. Ultimately, he proved too liberal for his own party and was ousted from power. He met an ignominious death after he was jailed for trying to foment an anti-government insurrection and then snatched from prison and lynched by an angry mob on January 28, 1912. Liberals remained in office, but the real power during the period was a plutocracy of coastal agricultural and banking interests, popularly known as La Argolla, or the Ring, whose linchpin was the Commercial and Agricultural Bank of Guayaquil. During World War I and the short boom that followed it, this clique further extended its influence and diversified its capital with a view to controlling the agriculture of the coastal plain. Cacao was the dominant export crop, as in the colonial period, but sugar and rice became increasingly important. A depression followed in the early 1920s. The price of food increased and exports in general declined. The sucre, the national unit of currency, fell rapidly in value. At the same time, the country's cacao plantations became infected with a fungus that ruined their production. These crises brought urban discontent, the formation of trade unions in Guayaquil, riots and massacres by the army. Hundreds died during riots and shootings in November 1922. In 1925, the army entered this turbulent situation, claiming that it wished to restore national unity and blaming many of the country's problems on the merchant bankers of Guayaquil Although the July Revolution failed to dismantle the power of traditional elites, it did succeed in establishing a state bureaucracy capable of governing with some autonomy from oligarchic interests. Moreover, it set an important precedent for the military itself. Rather than becoming a reactionary and oppressive force in public life, the armed forces identified themselves with reform and never restored to the kind of brutal repression later practiced by militaries elsewhere in the region. And instability continued to dominate Ecuadorian politics for most of the 20th century. One president, José María Velasco Ibarra, was elected five times between 1934 and 1972 and was ousted by the military before he could complete his term in all but one of his terms. Velasco Ibarra wasn't alone. In the 10 years between 1930 and 1940, 17 different presidents took a shot at leading Ecuador, not one of whom completed a term. Velasco Ibarra, though, was particularly destabilizing to Ecuador. He seemed to be able to win any election. Such was his popularity with the masses. But his terms of office were marked by sudden reversals in policy, contradictory economic programs, personal outbursts, temporary suspensions of civil liberties, and military interventions. This made it difficult for coherent political parties to develop or useful public policies to be maintained. This constant instability left Ecuador with a weaker army and more fragile state compared to its neighbors. This became particularly obvious when in July 1941, after long diplomatic bickering and a series of border incidents, the Peruvian army invaded, seized much of the disputed Amazonian area, and devastated El Oro province. The Ecuadorian forces, poorly trained and equipped, were easily defeated 
and the disgrace caused the overthrow of President Arroyo del Rio. The United States and the other major powers were too preoccupied with World War II to allow such small conflicts to destroy Allied unity or to disrupt the production of vital raw materials. A peace conference in Rio de Janeiro in 1942 forced Ecuador to relinquish its claims to much of the Amazonian region. Subsequently, Ecuador repeatedly attempted to reopen the question, claiming that the Protocol of Rio did not establish precise borders and that the new borders were therefore invalid. Ecuador had already lost much of the original land it claimed from colonial times, so this remained a sore subject for Ecuadorians for the following decades. Not surprisingly then, in 1960, the Ecuadorian government reneged on the Rio Protocol, and in 1995, Peru and Ecuador engaged in a very brief conflict deep in the Amazon. Known as the Senepa War, it led to a few hundred Ecuadorians dead in the final settlement of the Peru and Ecuador borders. Meanwhile, Ecuador's economy, erstwhile mostly based on banana exports, began to change when oil was discovered in the 1970s. The oil boom increased the size and wealth of the middle class, led to the building of infrastructure, and caused severe inflation. No basic structural reforms took place, however, and the poor suffered the effects of inflation but reaped few of the benefits of the oil boom. After oil was discovered, Ecuador began to borrow money with the belief that profits from oil exports would enable the country to repay its foreign debts. But this proved impossible in the mid-1980s due to the sharp decline in Ecuador's oil exports. World oil prices slumped in 1986, and in 1987, a disastrous earthquake wiped out about 40 kilometers of oil pipeline, severely damaging both the environment and the economy. The discovery of oil also opened up vast tracts of Ecuador's Amazon basin to exploration, affecting both the rainforest and the local indigenous tribes, some of whom had never before encountered outsiders. Velasco Ibarra's death and the withdrawal of the military officers from government allowed the country to return to an elected civilian government and a new constitution in 1979. Jaime Roldos Aguilera, a young social democrat, was elected president on a reformist platform. He promised greater social equality and a more equitable distribution of oil industry profits, but his promise ended tragically when less than two years into his presidency, he was killed in an airplane crash on May 24, 1981. The 1980s and early 1990s were a continuing struggle between conservatives and liberals, with corruption scandals weakening public confidence in the ruling elites. The contenders in the 1996 election were two firebrand politicians from Guayaquil, both known for their brashness. The candidate who won, Abdallah Bucaram, was nicknamed El Loco, or Madman for his fiery, curse-laden style of oration and his penchant for performing at rock concerts as part of his campaign. Bucaram promised cheap public housing, lower prices for food staples, and free medicine. But instead, he promptly devalued Ecuador's currency, the Sucre, and increased living costs, and was often spotted carousing in nightclubs by Quito residents. Within a few months, Massive strikes led by trade unions and the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador, or CONAIE, paralyzed the country. Congress declared Bucaram mentally unfit and terminated his presidency, and Bucaram fled to Panama. After the former president was ousted, his vice president, Rosalia Arteaga, became Ecuador's first female president, albeit for fewer than two days. Congress voted overwhelmingly to replace her with Fabiana Larcón, the head of Congress. He led the government until 1998 when Quiteño Camil Mawad of the Popular Democracy Party was elected president. Mawad had his political savvy put to the test. The effects of a nasty El Niño weather pattern and the sagging oil market of 1997-1998 sent the economy into a tailspin in 1999. The same year, the shrimp exports dropped by 80% following devastating shrimp diseases. When inflation topped 60%, making Ecuador's the worst economy in Latin America, the embattled president took drastic measures. He pinned Ecuador's economic survival on dollarization, a process whereby Ecuador's unstable national currency would be replaced by the U.S. dollar. Dollarization has been used successfully in a few other struggling countries, including nearby Panama. 
But when President Mawad declared his plan to dump the national currency, the country erupted in strikes, protests, and road closures. On January 21, 2000, marches shut down the capital and protests took over the legislative palace, forcing Mawad to resign. The protesters were led by Antonio Vargas, Colonel Lucio Gutierrez, and former Supreme Court President Carlos Solorzano, who then formed a brief ruling triumvirate. Two days later, and largely due to the international pressure that followed Latin America's first military coup in two decades, the triumvirate turned the presidency over to Vice President Gustavo Novoa. Novoa went ahead with dollarization, and in September 2000, the U.S. dollar became the official currency. Although one year earlier, 6,000 sucres bought one dollar, people were forced to exchange their sucres at the dramatically inflated year 2000 rate of 25,000 to one. Their losses were severe. Along with dollarization of the economy, Novoa also implemented austerity measures to obtain two billion in aid from the IMF or International Monetary Fund and other international lenders. At the end of 2000, Gas and cooking fuel prices skyrocketed, largely because of dollarization, and the new year saw frequent strikes and protests by unions and indigenous groups. In the end, dollarization did solve the inflation problem, and the economy stabilized, but at a huge social cost. Novoa, though, was able to leave in somewhat favorable terms. Former coup leader Lucio Gutierrez succeeded Novoa in 2002, promised a populist agenda but instead implemented IMF austerity measures to finance the country's massive debt. Protests erupted in the capital, and in 2005, Congress voted overwhelmingly to remove Gutierrez, the third Ecuadorian president ousted in eight years, replacing him with Vice President Alfredo Palacio. A political newcomer who referred to himself as a simple doctor, Palacio soon turned his attention to the social problems his predecessor had abandoned. In order to fund health and education programs and kickstart the economy, Palacio announced he would redirect oil profits earmarked for paying the foreign debt. An essential partner in this endeavor was Rafael Correa, a U.S. educated economist whom Palacio appointed as his finance minister and who later carried out even more aggressive social reforms while also consolidating power after becoming president in 2006. Correa describes himself as a humanist, a fervent Catholic of the left, and a proponent of 21st century socialism. After taking the reins, he ushered in a series of large-scale changes. A new constitution in 2008, approved by referendum, laid the groundwork for a new social archetype that increased spending on healthcare and the poor, gave more rights to indigenous groups, accorded new protections to the environment, and even allowed civil unions for gay couples. One of Correa's biggest targets was the oil industry. He called for increasing taxes on oil revenue to be spent on the Ecuadorian poor and accused foreign oil companies operating in Ecuador of failing to meet current environmental regulations. He also criticized his predecessor, Mawad, for adopting the U.S. dollar as the national currency and suggested Ecuador would return to the Sucre when economically feasible. More recently, Correa focused on creating a digital currency, but few entered the market. Supporters applauded Correa's attention to the poor and his focus on economic reform. Meanwhile, critics described Correa as an aspiring version of the late Hugo Chavez, Venezuela's former president. Others said he was reneging on his promises to protect the environment, particularly when drilling for oil began in 2016 in Parque Nacional. Lenin Moreno, formerly Correa's vice president, was elected in May 2017. In a historic moment, Moreno became the only global head of state in a wheelchair, having been paralyzed in an armed robbery in 1998. He was elected as Correa's protege, but within a few months he surprised many observers when he began reversing some of Correa's policies rather than preserving the status quo in anticipation of Correa seeking to return to office in 2021. Moreover, Moreno pushed for a referendum that would limit Ecuadorian presidents to two terms. An outraged Correa campaigned against the referendum, but on February 4, 2018, voters approved it by roughly a two-to-one margin, 
thus preventing Correa from ever running for the presidency again. This lost him the support of the Correistas, but that was just the beginning of his political problems as his popularity began to drop. This was especially true when in October 2019 he attempted to impose a number of IMF-backed austerity measures. The resulting higher gas prices, in particular, sparked massive mobilizations against the policies all over the country. He soon found his approval rating in the single digits and having to backtrack. Since its democratic transition in 1979, Ecuador has made great strides and seems to have finally found some stability and institutional consolidation in the 2010s. In 2021, Ecuadorians now face an election where Correa's new favorite candidate, Andres Arauz, will face the rights candidate, Guillermo Lasso. Will Ecuador continue to improve on its institutional consolidation, or will it backslide to its historical norm? Only time will tell.